Welcome to the premiere episode of The Science Table. On The Science Table, we're going to interview scientists and engineers and innovators and learn about the actual process of science in simple terms. We are in a very complex time in our history, and we have complex problems to work on. Hopefully, we can break this down into small pieces that we can all understand. We're going to shoot our first episode in a cave made from over 100,000 kilos of hand-poured concrete, built by my friend and inventor, Scotty Ziegler. And our topic? Energy. A candid debate about the choices that affect every person on this planet. With us, Dr. Frank Shu and Roland Coopers. Frank is an astrophysicist and energy advisor to Taiwan, and Roland is a physicist and former Shell Oil executive. He will be joining us all the way from the Netherlands via the new beam telepresence robot. Uh, obviously, you guys are focused on energy and have uh, amazing backgrounds in that area. Um, what are the misunderstandings by people about energy? What are we doing that's wrong in terms of energy? And what are we doing that's right in terms of energy? And I mean, and of course, I mean the future. What, what are we do, what, what's going to be happening 25, 50, and 100 years from now? And so, uh, Roland, what's confusing yeah. me a little bit in this is... Uh, what we decide to include in our collective price. Because when I think of nuclear, I look at the overhead. So I'm going to use the word overhead to mean anything other than the material itself. In the case of fuel, the overhead would be digging it out of the ground, transporting it. But in the case of wind, I think of giant machines that are constantly rusting and failing, and the overhead to replace them being very high, which tells me that there is some sort of problem. The energy uh, overhead uh, is so great that when amortized over time, I'm not sure those machines are worth it. I'm, I, I need to understand the economics at that level. Well, how, how do you even know that? I mean, are you investing in them? So, I mean, the point is, you know, you have large power companies that do these investments at, at a certain scale. And you, you look at the economics of those projects. When you have to make investment decisions this year, which is, you know, we're interested in what you can do now. So the point is actually getting on and doing something. Today, the cheapest um, source of, of non-fossil power is, um, in, in, certainly in Europe, and I believe it's true in many other places, is wind and solar. Um, the fact is, in the real world, nuclear is now the most expensive source of power that exists. Let me, uh, let me, let me have you address that. Yeah, I, I don't quite uh, agree with uh, Roland's analysis. Okay. I think uh, the thing that he left out, he emphasizes power. And when you consider power, that is correct what he said. But when you consider energy, which is after all what goes into how much carbon dioxide you emit, you have to include load factor. Typically in countries like France or the United States, nuclear power plants are on more than 90% of the time. Wind is only on 30% of the time, onshore wind. Solar, 20% of the time. So you have to multiply those numbers that he mentioned by five and three, respectively. And when you do that, they are not cheaper than nuclear power plants, not over the long run, even new nuclear power plants. In Europe, most of the cost is not in the cost of the panels, it's in the metal and in an installation. It's 75% of the cost. Yes, but specifically, um, Roland made a point, which I agree with, uh, in terms of the relative costs of things. And it seems to me that when you were responding to that, you're including in prices for things that are unrelated to the creation no. of the energy. And I want, I want you to address that. No, too. I addressed only the load factor. Right. Okay. How lo often do you use it? How often do you get to use it? I said you have to increase his cost by Three, when you consider wind, and by roughly almost five. That's not true, five. Frank. Come on. <laughs> well, that's, that's where the disagreement occurs. I want to understand, yeah. just right there, let's focus on why we don't agree on how we calculate this. Because people want to make score points, all right? I'm trying to be uh, as fair as I can, but obviously I'm also trying to score points, all right? Namely, you have to include usage. How often do you get to use it? When you don't use it, you have to burn fossil fuels. That's a choice. Or you have to use nuclear. Or you have to use hydro. All right. And those countries that have chosen nuclear and hydro, like France, like Sweden, have the lowest electricity costs. That's 
It's a fact. Okay. Okay. Well, give a moment. Let's let, let's let Roland address this. If you look at the price per kilowatt of wind, onshore wind in Europe, it is less than half the cost of new nuclear per kilowatt, and that's just the cost of of um, of and the tragedy in many ways of nuclear is that if you look back over the past 50 years, we've never actually built enough nuclear power plants for them to go down the cost curve. It's just possible that the current build program in China, where they're planning to build 100 nuclear power plants, according to the same design, that actually has the potential of substantially cost reducing nuclear. And if that was the case, then that would be a substantial contribution to the global commons that the Chinese made. That said, with the incredible advantage nuclear has by far over mechanical and by far over chemical, it scares people, and for good reason. We're living on a planet where when we get these huge advantages, we also have these huge responsibilities and disadvantages when something goes wrong. And so, Frank, what are your thoughts on the safety, on the long-term implications of that safety on everyone else? The three accidents that are traditionally pointed to are Three Mile Island, where no one died. Very little radioactivity was released. Fukushima, which was initiated by a magnitude 9 earthquake and a 14-meter tsunami, and yet the plant survived all those. What happened were then mistakes that were made concerning how to keep the reactor, which was shut down, from boiling off its water, cooling water. I don't care what caused the problem. Yes. We have the problem. Right, so let's come to Chernobyl, right? Where there were people killed. Nowhere near what the anti-nuclear activists say, all right? And it's because it was fundamentally flawed in its design. All reactors today shut down safely. It's to keep them cool. That's the problem. So you have why, to. Why aren't we going to be stupid tomorrow? Because you take humans out of the decision-making process. That's my favorite answer. You make answer. it intrinsically safe, so that the basic physics of the problem make it impossible to have really bad accidents. Accidents will always occur, all right, but they need not be dangerous. Okay, let's let's. You uh, have to sorry. weigh those dangers. You have to do a cost-benefit analysis. You have to weigh that against the certainty of the collapse of civilization if we keep burning fossil fuels the way we are. Please speak to it for yourself. How do we get past the fact that people are scared of this? You have to deal with the problems that you have. So today you cannot build nuclear power plants in developed countries. It'll take 10 to 15 years to get one license. It's also extraordinarily expensive. So. You know, what are we going to do? Sit on our hands and let the, the, the CO2 concentrations run up to 450 and 500 while we have some intellectual argument about whether nuclear on paper is better than something else? And, you know, clearly coal kills a lot more people than nuclear. That's absolutely true. And, and, but, but people aren't scared of coal and they're scared of nuclear. And, you know, we can, we can debate until the cows come home whether that's a good or a bad thing. But the point is actually making a difference in the real world, provide energy at a reasonable cost and, and with a lower carbon footprint. Okay. Thank Great. you so much. Thanks a lot, Roland. It was wonderful yeah. meeting you. Absolutely, in this strange fashion. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>